I think it's quite important that the three of us have come up together um, to talk about our journey in Plymouth because it has been a quite a, a long journey but it has been done in partnership. Um, it's our way, I think we've got to the point now that we have a whole life, whole system strategy in Plymouth that the whole of Plymouth is um, proud of. So um, I think it's, it's important that we're all here. The process, I think, probably started quite a long time ago um, with the establishment of a mental health, and it started off as a mental health provider network in Plymouth. Um, it's since changed to just the mental health network because we were recognised that really provider is not what we're talking about. We're talking about everybody in Plymouth. Um, and it's one of those things, you know, you're sitting with someone, with the old back of the fag packet sort of, discussion saying there's a need for us all to come together in Plymouth to look at how we deliver services effectively and efficiently and in a way that people want them delivered. Um, so from that we started the Mental Health Network. Yep, no, that, that was the right one. And we did that by bringing together just a group of people who had a passion, people who wanted to make changes, people who wanted to make it different for Plymouth. Um, and then we sort of thought, well, there's probably one or two key people that we need to have on board, like we need to have the local um, statutory services on board, um, commissioners who in England, I don't, do you have commissioners in Wales? In the same way, I don't think you do, do you? Well, in, in England, we have commissioners who buy our services um, and we provide. So we thought it's quite important to have them on board as well. Um, so a key group of people came together and we actually launched officially the network in April 2008. I'm sorry, it doesn't come out quite as well on this one as it did on my computer. Um, we've got lots of slides. That are, I think what is important is probably what we're going to say. Um, the purpose of the network, when we came together, was it was about we wanted to share information and good practice. We wanted to learn from each other. We wanted to work together. Um, we wanted to look at not... We had lots of little pockets of services around in the city. Some were doing the same things as others, there were gaps. How could we make it better and work in partnership to fill those gaps and to avoid the duplication? The other thing that we wanted to do, again, was raise awareness around mental health issues and decrease the stigma in the city. Um, and that was quite an important um, thing for us. And we put in there seats on SQIP. <laughs> now, that sounds a bit silly. SQIP is our place where... Um, we, as third sector statutory organisations, um, service users, carers, can all come together with commissioners to actually influence the way services move forward. Um, and for us, they call it the Strategic Quality Improvement Partnership. Um, but it's, it's the one place that we all get together, sit in the same room and can talk about things. Um, one of the first things that we did as a network was we said we were going to have an annual conference and this was going to be our way of sharing good practice, learning from each other and meeting each other um, on an informal basis. And we've now had, just had our fifth conference in March this year and starting to plan our sixth conference um, for next year. So um, we, we're getting quite good at it. Um, but one of the things that kept coming out of our conferences was that there's no overview, there's no way forward that we're all joined up to, that we're all working towards. Um, Organisations had their own strategies, commissioners had a bit of strategy, um, health services, the providers had some strategy, organisers had their own, but there wasn't one that pulled us all together. And from, I think it was our third conference, which was around recovery, um, we had a mandate from the conference to say, let's do something about this. Let's move it forward. Let's move on. 
So I'm going to now hand over to Nick, who's going to talk you through some of the things that we did to make that happen. Thanks, Sharon, and I can't emphasise uh, uh, how helpful Sharon's been in leading the uh, mental health uh, uh, network uh, that she's outlined. Uh, she's been chair of that since its outset, and I think has done an excellent job in moving that forward, both for the network and for the people of Plymouth as a whole. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, I, I, yep, that one works. <laughs> I'd just like to go through some early thoughts. Uh, as Sharon says, uh, the, uh, the, the um, conference that we held, the third conference, gave us a mandate uh, to develop a strategy uh, for Plymouth, for mental health in Plymouth. And uh, as a small group, we gave some early thoughts as to what should be included in that. Uh, where do we start? We had the privilege of starting with a blank sheet, and we didn't want to get it wrong. And our early thoughts recognised that we needed to uh, um, base our strategy on existing policies, both local and national. And, and I won't go into all of those in detail, because that would occupy another conference, but uh, uh, clearly the No Health Without Mental Health is a ne leading policy document in the UK, and that was one of the guidances that we, uh, uh, that, that we took. We, we didn't want to develop a policy uh, and a strategy that was not going to be widely acceptable, so it was based on well-known and well-accepted uh, um, uh, national and local documents. We also gave consideration to stakeholders, and we heard Angie talk quite articulately about the importance of involving communities, not just the usual suspects, I think was the point you were making. And that's exactly the stance we took up when looking at uh, which stakeholders which we should involve. Uh, we clearly wanted to involve the usual suspects, the users, the carers and the providers, but we also wanted the strategy to be uh, understood, relevant and accepted. Uh, by the much wider population. Um, so we involve people from all aspects of all communities, um, particularly significantly for me from the business community and the benefits of uh, improved mental health um, for the business and the economy world uh, I think should never be underestimated. So we wanted it to spread across all communities, not just the usual ones. We also, in having worked closely with John for many years, uh, uh, wanted to ensure that uh, the strategy wa was genuinely recovery-based. Uh, and uh, um, that's why we adopted in the strategy the principles of recovery, because we wanted a genuinely um, positive outcome for individuals, not the sort of outcomes that uh, Angie again referred to in her, um, uh, her talk about the approaches of the past uh, and the outcomes they've delivered that have been less than satisfactory. We also uh, recognised uh, that uh, the strategy should be about whole life, whole systems, because if you concentrate only on the illness that an individual has, uh, that that individual will never have the best quality of life. So we wanted to look at all aspects affecting the life of individuals. We and, and that involved us looking at the whole life in, uh, in all respects. And the next slide that I'll come on to will look at that. But to sum that part up, we wanted this strategy to be uh, a strategy that was for the people of Plymouth, developed by the people of Plymouth, not a small group of so-called experts. A whole life in, in all respects. We gave a lot of consideration to the issues that we would consider. And again, we could spend a lot of time looking at all the issues, and each, each person in the audience today would have a different view on what issues we should consider. But we included uh, a range of issues, such as uh, where individuals live, where you live, that, that's important. Uh, pati particularly in Plymouth, where we have one or two areas of extremely high social deprivation, uh, compared to the griefy, uh, green leafy suburbs that uh, have much lower levels of, um, of deprivation. Money is important to people's lives. How can you recover from an acute mental illness when you're sitting on a huge debt? Um, answers on postcards, please. How you spend your day. We know that spending uh, uh, time uh, involved in useful uh, uh, activities, not necessarily occupation, but activities, is important. As indeed it's social life for, for individuals, and uh, uh, we can all look at examples where social life has been taken away from people for all the wrong reasons. The access to... Uh, uh, advice and information that can help people with mental health issues is important. Uh, it's often difficult for people with mental health issues to engage and to receive advice and information, so it's important to give consideration uh, as to how that can be best delivered, by whom and where. 
Um, and of course, that leads on to access to mental health services uh, without proper access. And I do think in the UK, there's been great improvements uh, uh, in terms of access, but those improvements need to continue to ensure that people with mental health issues uh, can get access to services uh, at the right time and uh, um, as swiftly as possible. We, we also felt uh, a whole life in all respects involved having choice of services. Uh, too often has only a single service been offered to individuals and quite simply that's not good enough. Uh, the relationship with mental health workers is important. Uh, so many service users tell me that what really helped was the meaningful relationship they had with their health worker, regardless of who that worker was, whether it was a consultant, psychiatrist or a support worker. So getting those relationships is right. Um, consultation and control on behalf of the service user is important, so they feel uh, that they've got an active working part of their recovery and it's not something that's been done to them, but something they're participating in. Uh, advocacy, so um, service users can, if necessary, get the right help and support uh, for them to move on is important. And I'm guessing I don't need to tell this audience about the importance of reducing stigma and discrimination for all people within the mental health community, not just the people who experience problems. Access to physical health is, uh, it, it, we, we felt was an issue and too often people with mental health problems uh, have more serious physical health problems or are unable to get their physical health problems um, um, resolved as easily as they should do. Uh, and significant to me is a piece of research that's been done in the UK that suggests that people with a serious mental health issue will have a lifespan of 13 years less than somebody without one. And that's something that's quite simply not acceptable and needs to be addressed. Uh, and of course medication, uh, last but perhaps not least, uh, we'll all have our own views on that, uh, is an important part of the whole life in all respects. developing the strategy. Uh, I'd like to spend a, just a minute or two uh, talking about how we developed the strategy. Sharon's touched on where we started. We were told to do it by one of our conferences and we wanted to act positively uh, in response to that. Uh, so what we did is hold a stakeholder day. 5th of July 2011, a day people in Plymouth I hope remember fairly well. Uh, and we invited, it was an open invitation really, but over 60 participants um, uh, turned up at a meeting at the Guildhall in Plymouth. We got a nice venue for the day that was important. Uh, and it was important to us that they, the participants were from a very broad uh, background, not just the, the, the usual suspects and the usual mental health users, carers, uh, carers and providers. It was a very broad based uh, uh, group and numbered over 60. We also looked and worked very closely with uh, uh, the International Mental Health Network and ICRA at how we, uh, how we structured the day. Uh, the day was facilitated by uh, uh, the International Mental Health Collaborating Network in conjunction with ICRA, and we felt very privileged and very pleased that they were able to uh, support us in that and have continued to support us in developing the strategy. And the structure of the day was based around life domains as we identified, and I'll come on to those in a minute. But the structure of the day also asks key questions, and we want to be as simple as possible. And there are simple approaches to this. Uh, and the key questions were very simply, what are the needs? Are the needs being met? And how could they be better met? How can we do better? Never lose sight of continuous development. The life domains, and again, this is an area where I think we could all have different uh, uh, views, but we decided on the following uh, life domains, and these uh, domains were the structure of our, uh, our day. Uh, and the domains, as you can see there, are art, culture, and spirituality, education and occupation, friends and families, housing, social networks, sport and leisure, treatment, therapies and alternatives, and how to commission services, which we do in the UK, and uh, transform and develop. And uh, rightly or wrongly, those uh, were the elements and items that structured that stakeholder day. And I'll now pass over to Sharon. It's her turn again to talk about some of the key themes. You can see the partnership working. Um, some of the key themes that came out from our discussions during the day were People were saying they wanted a centralised signposting and advice and information. Somewhere where they could go, where they could get the information that they needed, rather than going to one place, they'd been told to go somewhere else, or having to go to three places, or wanted one centralised place. 
Um, promotion of good mental health. So coming back down the line a bit before people actually get so ill that they need hospitalisation or they need secondary mental health services. So looking at some early intervention. Um, stigma again was one of the areas that came up and always I think comes up and will come up unfortunately for a little while yet although it is getting better. Um, again intervention at primary care level better linking between secondary, primary and third sector organisations to try and get support in at a primary care level, not always um, later on. Um, support to facilitating, facilitate engagement. Um, people were saying sometimes they find it difficult to actually get somewhere in the first place. Um, they know that they want to do it, but actually taking that first step is, is often the difficult one. Um, so some help and support to be able to do that. Easy access, you don't have to jump through 6,000 hoots before someone will see you, um, which is often the, the, the case. Carer support, um, I think that's one area that probably in Plymouth we're not brilliant at at the moment. Um, support for carers, friends, family, loved ones, anyone who happens to be involved with, with the individual with the lived experience. Working together in partnership, um, a biggie, um, and I think we're actually getting there in Plymouth. I think now the network's been there for a few years. People are actually beginning to trust each other, are beginning to work together. I think the economic climate has helped that in the fact that uh, you know, we, we can't all go for the same small pots of money. It's better to work together and get the pots of money into the city and work, and you work together to use them effectively. Um, security of funding was a big, um, I, I suppose, uh, aimed at commissioners. Um, there are a lot of small organisations who happen to get funding for a year, if you're lucky. By the time you've got your service set up, you're there saying, sorry, we can't give you any money, you know, we can't give, provide the service any longer. Um, other organisations get three years fundings. Um, there needs to be some parity around how all organisations are funded. Um, and say particularly, um, I've moved now from, from working in health to working in the, th the third sector. Um, and, you know, trying to run a service on a year-by-year -year contract is, is pretty difficult. Um, and you can't get the continuity for staff. You can't get the continuity for the people who want to use the service. Um, so that was a big sort of dig if you like at commissioners to say let's look at how the whole funding goes across the board um, again recovery is there central to everything um, and financial capability was something that came up quite strongly and that was about enabling people to actually manage their own finances um, well um, it's not only about people not having money or um, having debt or whatever, but having actually the ability to be able to learn how to, to manage their finances better. So what happened after we had that nice stakeholder day, which those themes came out of? We then had a mandate from the, the people who were at the stakeholder day to carry this forward. And we did this by having working groups around each of the life domains that, that Nick spoke about. Um, and then we had a reference group <coughs> which included commissioners um, and the main sort of leaders in, in the city so that working groups could actually go back to the reference group so that we were bringing it all together. It wasn't just the game, things happening in silos and pockets. It was coming in and working into one place. Um, we also said that we would um, go back to a second stakeholder day to feed back the work that had been done in the smaller groups. So again, making sure that everybody's input was there. It wasn't just small groups who decided that that's what we, is best for Plymouth. So we had a second stakeholder event, um, which was just about a year later. Um, this has been quite a long process, but I think it's important that it's been a long process, and I think we'll probably keep saying that. Um, so we had the second stakeholder event, 
the draft of the where we were going with the strategy was presented it was agreed and then a group of us got together to actually write the final document um, and we tried to keep it not too long um, and we have got a few copies here or if people do want it we can always email it to you if you give us your email address so we finally launched our whole life whole systems um, strategy for Plymouth at our fifth conference from the network in March this year um, and we're hoping to have a, a more formal launch um, later in the year I think if we do a bit of a joint effort here if you go in the spirit of true partnership <laughs> Um, the strategy document came up with 15 recommendations and uh, we're, we're not going to go through all of those 15 recommendations that would probably take too long but they are all listed in the uh, in the strategy document they don't fit on the screen either. no they won't fit on the screen either <laughs> so that helps as well um, but we're setting up action groups to move forward on each of the uh, 15 recommendations uh, and again there'll be broad-based action groups but I think Sharon's going to summarize what those recommendations are all about and what they involve I think for us there are three key areas coming out of, of the recommendations. Um, one is around training and that's training for everybody. Um, it's not just people who provide services, it's not just service users, it's not just the community. It's about everybody learning more about mental health, more about recovery, where they fit into the whole rather than where they fit into their little bit. Um, and I think that's, that's quite important. And if we can bring everybody together across those um, domains, actually we can start learning from each other um, and working together. Um, the second area, the theme that was coming out was around the range and choice of opportunities that are available for people um, and upstreaming. So getting in earlier. And that seemed to be a constant theme that's been been coming out is we need to intervene or we need to support people at an earlier stage um, and then the, the third key theme I think that's come out which I mentioned earlier is support and services for families carers friends colleagues anyone who happens to be supporting alongside in touch with someone with a mental health issue who wants to support wants some help but also needs their own support as well and I think that's quite important that we need to recognize that we support those people so I think those were really our three key themes that that have come out right we've done the recommendation so we have a strategy but that's not good enough. We don't want to just leave it there. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, I know I keep harping on about these commissioners, but they are quite important in, in England. Um, we have to have them on side because they're the people who hold the money. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, um, I met um, as chair of, of the network with our three main commissioners who commission services around mental health. So that was our Commissioner for Public Health, our Commissioner for Mental Health Services, and our Commissioner in the City Council who um, commissions services around mental health. And they got them all sat in a room, and they've all signed up. Um, I must admit, we went, we were, when Nick and I were talking about the meeting, we were sort of a bit of uh, trepidation because we weren't sure what's going to come out of it. But they said it was a well-written document it was done from across the city it was well informed and they wanted to use it as one of their three informing documents for commissioning services in Plymouth um, so we're really proud that we've actually got to that step um, they've also agreed that the network will lead on the implementation of the um, strategy so we've now set up an implementation group. We've had our first meeting. And the nice thing was, not everybody sitting in that room were 
directly involved in mental health services. We had people from housing associations. We had people from a local education college. They wanted to come, university, they have wanted to come and join us. Um, and we think we've actually sort of moved things forward by getting other people to think. We're changing the thinking, as John would say, um, around mental health services and what it means to everybody in the community, not just those usual suspects, as, as Nick says, those people who are already involved. Um, so our next thing, as I've said, is that we're going to have a um, formal launch. We haven't sorted that out yet because we're just getting the um, strategies finally printed in nice glossy brochures. Um, but we hope they won't be glossy brochures that will go on shelves. They're gonna be, it's going to be a glossy brochure that people are going to use and refer to. But on saying that, because it has been a bit of a long road from day one to, to getting a strategy written and looking at um, how we're going to implement it, just to say we haven't been standing still. Um, things have been happening alongside. We know the areas that are important. So some of the things we've actually done in Plymouth or are looking at in Plymouth um, are we have now opened a recovery college. Um, Mind have got a recovery college. It's open to everybody, whether you're a service user, whether you're a carer, whether you're someone who's interested in mental health. It's there. You can learn more about mental health. You can get support. Um, and you can build resilience. And that's probably one of the important things. Um, we're talking about a mental health skills academy, or mental health academy. And we're talking with um, the University of Plymouth to look at how we can develop some of the training that we'd already started talking about. Um, looking at skills-based training um, and spreading that out across the city in a way, range of, of different ways. And we've started working quite closely with the mental health promotion team and developing a mental health strategy around mental health and well-being. So we're, that's sort of trying to involve the whole of the community. So things haven't just stood still, we have moved forward. And I'm just going to hand back to Nick to do the final reading. Hi again. Um, I'm not a clinician, I'm a manager, so I like to cut through the fog of these strategies and say, what does it really mean? And uh, Sharon and I had a debate about how we should begin to conclude our bit of this. And I said, I'd like a slide that says, so what does it really mean? What are the key issues? Um, what's important here? Uh, and during one of our conversations, I think it was John that used the term holes, not holes, uh, a very subtle difference, but it is about whole systems, not about holes in systems. And that's exactly what this strategy intends to do, make sure it is a continuum and it's not a, a continuum that's um, full of gaps. It's also about effective communications. Uh, the reason for involving broad-based stakeholders was effective communications. Uh, and I don't need to give anybody here a lecture on the importance of communications and the fact that communications are important at a whole range of different levels. Cohesion and co uh, uh, not competition. This is something very close to my heart and I could talk and probably have in the past talked all day about this. Um, it's about partnerships and we've heard uh, uh, certainly from uh, uh, previous speakers about the importance of working in partnerships. And I think it's important to work in cohesion with other organisations, uh, no matter how closely connected or whether on the periphery of what we're doing, uh, and not work in competition. And I see too many organisations that work in silos, not, not working together. And I think Paul raised the issue of uh, addressing complex needs and ever increasing complex needs. And my argument would be you can't do that, you can't address complex problems if you're working in isolation. It means working together, working in cohesion, and that's particularly important. Uh, and finally, I think it means, and I'm paraphrasing John again here, change the culture, change the thinking, and change the system. Um, that's what it's all about at the end of the day. And to sum up this part, before we hand over to Dave to talk about that, uh, we did have a subtitle for this, um, uh, that this presentation. And the subtitle, and we did think about a song and dance partnership here, but uh, backed off at that at this stage. We thought it might uh, do our credibility no good at all. Uh, but it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. The how is as much as, is as important as the what you're doing on issues like developing strategies and changing thinking. Thank you. 
So the next bit, Dave's going to talk about, Dave's uh, heading up uh, mental health services in the largest uh, provider organisation that we've got, and we felt it was particularly important for Dave to look at what it means for that large organisation. Um, so Dave's going to talk about that uh, as the next item, and we're just loading up his slides to enable him to do that. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I'll just wait till my slides come up. Um, we do have a version of the presentation where all of the slides are together in true partnership, but uh, Apple Mac doesn't seem to be compatible with uh, safe sticks for anybody that's interested out there. Anyway, good morning, everybody. Um, very nice to be here. Uh, my name is David McCauley. I'm a, a manager for Plymouth Community Healthcare. Um, Apple Mac doesn't seem to like PowerPoint either. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. That looks. Uh, um, and it's, it's, it's very interesting for us because we are um, a provider of generic community services, which includes mental health. Um, and we are a provider that arose from transforming community services. And we're actually a community interest company or a social enterprise. Um, and we are the provider arm of what was NHS Plymouth and Plymouth PCT, which was a commissioning and provision um, organisation. I want to talk a little bit about how we embed the um, whole life, whole systems thinking within practice and make it reality for both our staff and people who use our service. And the first thing I just want to talk about is clinical engagement because within the workforce, of course, the vast majority of our expense and resource is uh, focused on our staff. And without their engagement and their sign up to the values that underpin this approach, we just wouldn't achieve anything. So the first thing we did was to set up internally, as well as the external uh, whole life, whole systems board, an internal group that was charged with leading the implementation of uh, the whole systems, whole life strategy within our own provider organization. Clinical leadership, um, as well as engagement, of course, is key within that. And we trained a number of uh, clinicians to be the champions for the implementation. And the way we embedded that was through training and supervision. And the champions were charged with developing training sessions. We've recently gone through quite a significant service transformation. And training in terms of values and skills has underpinned that whole process. And we've also embedded a process of um, reflective practice and again, that's led by the clinical champions who are trained in the recovery of whole life, whole systems approaches. So the, the aim of this really is to embed it within clinical practice in a way that um, ensures that it really truly um, delivers change. Thinking more broadly, we also wanted to ensure that um, not only um, were the values and beliefs that we've, um, we've talked about and the changes in practice embedded within practice, but we also want to ensure that um, it's embedded in the way that our, our services are commissioned and contracted. So we've um, worked quite closely with our commissioners um, looking at um, what we call sequin targets. Some of you will be very familiar, but these are basically stretch targets for how we improve our services. And we've agreed that uh, recovery methods will be included within that and we'll be required to report on that um, on a monthly basis. We also ensured that there was uh, senior support for the strategy, both within our own organisation, Plymouth Community Healthcare, but also um, at um, senior commissioning level as well. Um, it, it, it's a complex structure commissioning now um, within England and many of you will know that we've recently gone through quite a, a system transformation whereby what were um, 
primary care trusts, which uh, provided the commissioning function, have now moved and changed and become um, clinical commissioning groups, which are GP-led commissioning authorities and bodies. And that's meant quite a significant change in, in organisational boundaries and structures. Um, I won't elaborate on this point too much because Nick and Sharon, I think, have covered it um, adequately. But uh, we, as a main provider, um, don't see ourselves working in isolation. And in order to provide the most effective, efficient services, we have to do that in collaboration with our, you know, our third, part, uh, um, third sector partners. And working alongside organisations like Mind has been invaluable, really, in, in delivering good outcomes for people who use services. So just thinking about some of the, the benefits, um, I, I mentioned earlier that um, since transforming community services, we are um, Plymouth Community Healthcare, a community interest company, a social enterprise. Uh, it's very interesting because um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the uh, Public Services Open Bracket um, Social Value Act of uh, 2012. Looking around the room, no? Well, it's, in, it's an interesting piece of legislation that makes it incumbent upon um, those who procure and commission public services to consider during the process uh, not only the commissioning of health and social care services, but what added value can be brought in terms of social and economic benefits for the local community. It's also very much enshrined within the, um, the values of a social enterprise. So for us, this is a really good opportunity to, to, to add value to what we do. And there's some really good examples of that. So at the moment, we're, we're thinking, for example, about having a scheme whereby we encourage volunteers from within the community to come and work with us. And um, also, we're thinking about how we encourage those who might have used our services to come and work for us. Um, and the social value um, is significant, not just in terms of individual self-esteem, and uh, you know, in, in enhancing their roles within um, the community, but also in terms of the effect they have it has within their families and the well-being that that generates. And of course, there's financial benefits in terms of you know the simple fact that you know folk will not be uh, claiming any benefits if, if they're in employment. So these are some of the things that you know, as a social enterprise, as a community interest company, enables us to think about. Um, I think it's also really important to um, think about uh, feedback from those who use our service. We've recently implemented a system whereby we can get real-time feedback. So if the changes we're bringing about aren't meeting the needs or the requirements of those who use services, we will know and know very quickly, and that's really important to us. There's also potential benefits in terms of outcomes. And again, many of you will be aware of payment by results. And um, what we've tried to do is enshrine within the care pathways um, outcomes that relate to whole systems and whole life. So again, we're very clear about what the expectations are, both from commissioners and in terms of the, the, the dialogue we have with our staff and people who use services. Um, I just want to talk a little bit now about some of the challenges and opportunities. The slide will come up. There you go. I wasn't aware it was going to do that, actually. <laughs> um, I've just mentioned a little about, about payment by results and ensuring that outcomes are embedded within those pathways. Um, however, some of the um, issues I think we face are things like consistency in application and practice. You'll always get some individuals who are, who are champions of recovery and recovery approaches and you'll get some that are a bit more cynical. And it, it is very helpful to have leaders within your workforce that are passionate and care and drive, and, and drive changes forward. However, we also know that if we're dependent on individual leaders, that also has risks associated with it. If those individuals leave, for example, the changes very often reverse. So we need to make sure that they are truly embedded systemically. Um, 
So I think consistency is absolutely essential and how we monitor and measure that is, is, is going to be really important, I think, because it, again, it comes down to quality and there's a lot of debate about quality within healthcare services. You know, read the Francis report and others, including Winterbourne, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, I think if we get it right, we will deliver genuinely person-centered care that enables and promotes res responsibility and recovery in a way that I think the system has never been able to deliver before. And ultimately, we will, we will en enable folk to recover and uh, to give people back their lives, not that it's the to give them back, but we will be in a position where you know, we'll, we'll be you know, helping them and supporting them access things like housing, training, education, and we know at the end, at the end of the day, that 